O of 2. In this process, we would look at a couple of processes, genetic processes as well, and that is how do we form hybridomas? And number two, how can we form a recombinant technology or how can we use recombinant technology to make the monoclonal antibodies? So let's start a discussion. I'm going to share my screen and we would start discussing. <clears throat> so today is May 7th, and this is the situation, 3.8 million uh, folks who are confirmed infected and 268,999 deaths so far. So it just continues to go up. So let's start from here. I wanted to show you a um, chrono chronolo chronological order as well of the of the various uh, reports that came out. So here in um, 7th March, this was the trends in immunology where the authors here, they said that, hey, there are possibilities that the there are multiple proteins in SARS-CoV-2 and those proteins may be the target of a monoclonal antibody. So they have mentioned various proteins over here. They have mentioned the S protein, which is a spike protein, which we all know. Now that spike protein is the one that, that the virus uses to bind with ACE2 and then go into our cell. So they have uh, put in specific stress on that. And you would see that in all of this literature that we'll discuss today, spike protein are the main players. So then they have shown that how does entry work? And finally, what is interesting for me is that down here they said, so at this time there was no news that we have monoclonal antibodies being produced. I'm sure that there were companies that were working on it. But down here they said, once we have, we have polyclo polyclonal antibodies, which I would explain in a second, from the recovered patients, but they say that we do not have monoclonal antibodies yet. And then they say one, once such antibodies that are monoclonal are produced, the next step will be to uh, test these in, in vitro and then produce them in mass. And then finally, they, they think, therefore, it may take one to several years for such SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing monoclonal antibodies or their fragments to be ready for human use. So there are a couple of things over here. The one thing is that please see that the authors think that this would take many years. Number two, look at the, the term here, neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So I would like us to know today when we are done with the, with the discussion, at the end of that, we should know what are polyclonal antibodies, what are monoclonal antibodies, how are monoclonal antibodies better than polyclonal number and then what is the what is a neutralizing antibody and then what is a hybridoma and finally what is the recombinant technology to make these antibodies so and of course we'll talk about what is the function of monoclonal antibodies how can these help so this is where we started with three seven then in san francisco on march 25 there was a company called Vir Biotechnology, and they said that we have the uh, couple of antibodies that can be used to neutralize or to prevent and treat COVID-19. And again, we'll talk about it. What do they mean by that? And here they said that first, so they gave four benefits of a monoclonal or, or an antibody treatment, and that was prevention of the disease in healthcare workers. Then secondly, they said that um, prevent the progression of the disease in people who are already uh, sick with it and then treat the very severe disease and finally make vaccines. So this was on March 25. Then on April 6th, this was another paper that was presented where the researchers said that they have created two um, antibodies and if you see here they are from china so this this was a study from china and, and they said that we have two monoclonal antibodies cloned from the mammary b cells of the patients we'll talk about it how did they do it then this is another study or a paper this was uh, from the uh, this is also the china i think the previous paper that i showed you was printed here in cellular on 20 april so this these two are the same then here, this 
Eve Netherlands. So Wang et al. from the Netherlands University attract, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, that is where they came back and they said, we have a monoclonal antibody that can be used to block SARS-CoV-2. Again, we will have this discussion today that what does this mean? I want to show you the chronological progression. Then, uh, then this is the May 4th. Again, this is the Attract University. This is an article about them. So this is the same thing. And finally, a few days ago, actually, May 5th. Today is May 7th. May 5th, we have a news as well that Israel's Institute for Biological Research Institute has been working on the monoclonal antibody production as well. And they also have a monoclonal antibody ready. So, of course, if they have it ready on, um, on 5th, they must have been working on it for some time. And what is interesting here is I would like us to keep this in mind as well, that they're, I believe, their defense minister, um, Israel's defense minister, Naftali Bennett, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, they had said that these are the important properties of a monoclonal antibody. And the properties in their point of view, antibody is monoclonal, new, refined, contains an exceptionally low proportion of harmful proteins. That means it can hurt the virus, neutralize the virus, but not hurt the human being. And again, we will talk about it in a second. Second, they said, Antibody is able to neutralize the coronavirus, and then the antibody is able to neutralize the aggressive forms of the coronavirus. So these were the discussions. So uh, acoustic therapy uh, theory, this is a very, very good question that can you take the memory B cells from someone and have them injected into the other people? <coughs> that is equal to tissue transplant. And the all transplant issues can come with that, especially when we are transplanting immune system cells, because these are fighter cells by, by their behavior. So um, they may or may not be easy to transplant, but great idea. OK, so now let's. I'm drawing some of these things for us. So look, this is a B cell. A B cell is a kind of a lymphocyte, correct? Other lymphocytes are T cells, which may be helper T cell or cytotoxic T cells. A B cell, when it becomes active, when it starts making immunoglobulins, then the B cell is called a plasma cell because it looks like it has lots of cytoplasm, plasma cell. So what happens is the B cell I used to, when I was studying medicine, I used to call it a pregnant cell. So what would happen is the nucleus, if you see here, the nucleus would open up a little bit because there are there is active gene expression going on to make the antibodies. So you could see the chromatin in the nucleus. It becomes eccentric as well. It's not in the center of the cell anymore because in the remaining part of the cell, the cytoplasm, here there, there are antibody manufacturing factories going on. And because of that, the nucleus is pushed on a site. So this is a plasma cell. So plasma cell is nothing but an active B cell, which is actively making antibodies in its cytoplasm. And so it has a lot of cytoplasm. That's why it is a plasma cell. And then the antibodies that it make are structured like this. So usually an antibody has a heavy chain. So here the blue one is called a heavy chain. And then a light chain or two light chains, two heavy chains and two light chains, light chains. So here is one heavy chain. This is another heavy chain. This is this is one light chain. This is another light chain. And um, light chain is shown in the diagram outside or inside doesn't matter. This is just a, a um, illustration. It is not the actual anatomy of the antibody. So I've seen some people uh, saying that, hey, the light chain should be on the inside. Doesn't matter, inside or outside. These chains are connected with each other with disulfide bonds here. Now, what is important for today's discussion is that this part, I'm going to block it out like this. This part of the antibody is called a variable region 
a variable region. The remaining parts are called constant regions. In this variable region, antibodies have different shapes and they can bind different kind of epitopes over there, epitopes over there or epitopes. What does that mean? So if I just make some examples of this part, so maybe there is an antibody. Let's say this is an antibody and it can bind to a square thing. And antibodies have at least two areas of binding. So these are the, they can bind two square antigen. I'm just making up type of antigens. Maybe there is another antibody which on its binding site can bind two rounded antigens. And then there is another antibody that on its binding site can bind two triangular antigens. The point is that the this part of the antibody is to bind with the antigen and perform its function. The lower part of the antibody, this part, is usually for it to bind with the tissues, for example, mast cells and other pieces of our tissue. So with this introduction, antibody, plasma cell and B cell, now let's see how a B cell is activated. And we have done this discussion before. I wanted to now today for monoclonal antibody discussion, we should be very clear what is an epitope or epitop, whichever way it should be pronounced. So look, uh, we talked about coronavirus yesterday. I'm going to do that again. So let's say this is a coronavirus. And the coronavirus has, let's say this is the membrane, the red one. Then it has spike proteins, making them in blue. Then it has some other proteins as well. Inside the virus, we have RNA, which are also antigenic, possibly. Then there are proteins attached with the RNA, which are called capsid proteins, which may be antigenic. There may be other proteins sitting in the virus as well, which are antigenic too. If you lay them all out in the open, then what you would have is you'll have multiple patterns of antigens, correct? So our body, our body can react or recognize, our cells can recognize parts of these antigens. And what happens is that that part of an antigen that our body can, our immune system can recognize is called an epitope or epitope, whichever way it is pronounced. I keep saying because I call it epitope. So these are the recognizable parts of an antigen. And please remember from coronavirus, there may be <laughs> excuse me, there may be thousands of antigens or hundreds of antigens in coronavirus. Every part of the virus may act like an antigen because it's a unique pattern. The spike protein is an antigen or it may be there are multiple antigens on the spike protein. The membrane, membrane, other proteins, RNA, nucleocapsid and so on. Now, our cells when they are infected with the virus, so let's say this is our cell, some cell here, and this cell has coronavirus in it. When our cells are infected with virus, let's say lung epithelium cell, our cells have the tendency or possibility of showing that virus on their surface or part of the virus on their surface on something called MHC1. It's a protein. So normally an MHC1 can show from 8 to 11 peptides. That means a very small part, 8 to 11 amino acid sequences, also very tiny part of the bacteria or virus or pathogen. On the other hand, as we know from our past discussions, there are some specific cells that are called professional antigen presenting cells. Their job is to arrest these enemies, the viruses, bacteria, fungi, and other things. And then their job is to present their pieces onto their surface. So these are called professional antigen presenting cells. And these cells can pre present the antigen called MHC2 instead of one. And MHC2 is a little bit more capable and it can show amino acid patterns 
which are 13 to 17 amino acid long or peptide long. So this is just generally the epitope and what it is and what kind of epitopes can be there. Now, a different matter is that I heard one person make the claim that there is no effective vaccine against RNA viruses, but I don't know if that's true. So acoustic theory, that's a very good question and, and comment. We'll talk about that as well, that if there is no vaccine or not. So now let's see for a second how a B cell becomes active. We have done this discussion many, many times that the macrophage would eat up the pathogen and then it would present that on its MHC2 and then there would be a T helper cell that would connect. So I'm, I'm leaving that whole part out. Over here, this is a T cell. This guy is a T cell. This is a B cell. What happens is, first of all, this central part, the B cell is showing an antigen on its surface. So let's say this is the spike protein. Let me make it a little bigger. So let's say this is the piece of spike protein from coronavirus. And B cell is the one that is showing it. Then comes a T cell. So my T cells usually wear a T. They have a T on them. So my T cell comes in and, the <coughs> excuse me, T cell then connects with this MHC2. This is the MHC2 we talked about. And this is the T cell receptor. They connect. Once they connect, what T cell does is it needs to further stimulate. And this is why I have over here, XO, 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 XO. There are hugs and kisses that are going to happen. So what happens is that T cell is now further going to hug the B cell through a protein called CD40 ligand. So it has a CD40 ligand protein here. B cell has a CD40. They both also connect. So this is a double checking. So we are making sure that the things, the immune system doesn't become active just by itself, just without any good reason. So here we are double checking. First, the B cell presented the antigen. T cell looked at it. Then it said, okay, I understand that you want help. Can you also connect with me on CD40 line as well to see if you really want help? And now the CD40 is also connected. Then there's a third outcome and that is that once they are connected then the T cell is going to start releasing various cytokines for example it would release IL-4, IL-5 and so on. These cytokines are then these are like kisses and the ligands were hugs so these cytokines are going to go and attach to B cell which in turn causes the B cell to number one proliferate that means there are copies of the B cell that are made and number two it would cause the B cell to become a plasma cell or active cell and start producing immunoglobulins. So B cell will need activation by a T cell to start working. There are some B cells that can work without activation. We do not care for those over here. We are more interested in these B cells that need T cell activation. So this far correct? Are we good so far? So we know there are B cells, we know there are plasma cells, we know there are antibodies, we know that antibodies have binding regions. Then we also know that we have epitopes. Epitopes are the parts of an antigen, smaller piece of antigen that binds at the binding region. Our immune system can recognize it. So far, so good? So Siddhartha, yeah. So there is a question that is, is there both T and B cell proliferation? Correct, there is a both T and B cell proliferation, but this particular um, this per particular uh, circuit that we are looking at and the IL-5 and IL-4 uh, um, release, IL-4 would help class switch and IL-5 would help proliferate. But yes, in general, in the immune system, both kind of cells would proliferate. No worries, uh, Gazer, thank you very much for being here. Okay, so continuing. Now let's idea of what is a polyclonal antibody versus a monoclonal antibody. So look, we just talked about the coronavirus. So here is a coronavirus, correct? Coronavirus and other viruses and other uh, bacteria and fungi and yeast and other things, they all have multiple antigens on them. Imagine our body. 
all of our body has so many parts and patterns in it and every piece of tissue and microscopic part of our tissue is a pattern. Similarly, even when the viruses are very small, they still have so many parts in them that there are hundreds of patterns on each part. So let's say these are a bunch of B cells that are sitting here. These B cells have gotten the coronavirus. They have seen it. And as I had mentioned before, every B cell has on its surface these receptors, these are actually immunoglobulin Ds. It has receptors to bind with the antigens, correct? But but if you can see the, the shapes of the anti antigen binding sites are different. So here it is boxy, here it is rounded, here it is something else, and here it is triangular. And every B cell has a different shape. Their variable regions are different so they can catch other patterns when they become active so let's say we have a coronavirus here this coronavirus when we broke it down into smaller pieces as we discussed yesterday that our system breaks down viruses and uh, the bacteria into smaller pieces when we break it down into smaller pieces it is possible that some part of it fits here with this b cell another part of that coronavirus same coronavirus another smaller part fits with this b cell Another part, let's say this is the spike protein that fits with this B cell and maybe another part fits here. So what will happen is all of these B cells will become active and they all would start releasing their antibodies. And you can see that their antibodies will all have different shapes. Every B cell produces an antibody that is of the same shape as its receptor. So once we have that, that means that the antibodies that are being produced in this person are going to be polyclonal. What does that mean? There are different types of antibodies, different shapes or binding region antibodies for the same virus. Some of those antibodies, let's say we make the virus here, coronavirus, and we have those polyclonal antibodies that are being generated. And we all make polyclonal antibodies when we become infected with anything. Some of these antibodies are going to come in and attach to the spike proteins. Some of them are going to attach here. Maybe there's a pattern. Some of them are going to attach maybe the RNA pieces that are here. It's going to attach to the RNA piece. Some of them are going to attach to, let's say, matrix protein or part of the matrix protein and so on. The point is our body naturally produces hundreds and thousands of antibodies against one pathogen. Now, here is an important, very important concept. That is, out of all those antigens, so let's say there is an antigen attached here, sorry, antibody, AB, attached here on the pathogen. Another antibody is attached here on the pathogen. Another antibody is attached here. Another antibody is attached here. Question is, out of all of them, are they all effective to kill this or neutralize this virus or maybe one or two? This is where the concept of neutralizing antibody comes in. We researchers, doctors, scientists, we have to find an antibody that when connecting with the virus will make the virus neutral. It will make the virus incapable of doing the damage. For example, if we can find an antibody, and this is true for coronavirus, if we can find an antibodies and we have that connects with the spike protein, then coronavirus somehow cannot connect with the ACE2 enzymes and cannot become internal, internalized. So now it is essentially neutralized. Even when it is present in our body, it is neutralized. But on the other hand, if there is an antibody, let's say that is against M protein, and that is attached here, that M protein antibody is going to do not much of harm and it would allow the virus to still continue to bind with our ACE2 and get into our cell. So that antibody is useless. That means these guys, these B cells in us, when they are making thousands of types of antibodies against one virus, most of those you can say are going to be just water. They're going to do nothing. But one or two of them or maybe 10 or 20 of them are going to be poison. 
when the virus gets that poison, it's going to die. Those antibodies that actually cause impact on the virus are called neutralizing antibodies. So two concepts now are done. One is that in our body, when we, when we react to the virus, we make polyclonal antibodies because we make antibodies to against many parts of that virus. That is why when you use convalescent plasma, when you take plasma from a person and put it in another person, that by definition is called polyclonal antibody plasma or set. Now the problem is, it is very difficult to scale thousands of antibodies. So let's say we have you, I got infection, then I got recovered, you take my plasma, I have thousands of antibodies against various parts of coronavirus. Now you want to manufacture those in a factory and put them in a bottle and then send them out in the whole world. The question is, are you going to now manufacture thousands of antibodies? And let's say maybe just two of them are actually neutralizing. The remaining are just useless. And now you are manufacturing thousands and thousands and filling them up. And, and maybe the actual antibodies are really in small amounts and not enough to be given to someone. So then our problem becomes that out of all of those polyclonal antibodies, can we find antibodies that can cause or that can neutralize the virus, number one? And number two, which one are those? And number three, how can we produce those in mass instead of all the antibodies? That is a basic problem. And that's what we are solving here. So the question becomes, I, I, somebody asked me this question this morning. They said, why not we just give plasma to everyone? Look, that is polyclonal antibody. That is correct. Secondly, we cannot get so much plasma. If let's say we have a country where 100,000 people are sick and maybe 20,000 need um, antibodies, for and let's say for each person, we need one bag of plasma daily. That means for 20,000 people, we need 20,000 bags of plasma every day for six days. Uh, I'm making... I'm assuming that they're all sick at the same time. Imagine they're not, that's fine. But I'm, I'm talking about the scale. Now we need 20,000 people to be donating their plasma every day for six days. Or we need, let's say if one person donates the plasma only once, then we need 120,000 people who had already become sick and recovered and had the antibodies. So the scale for the polyclonal or for the convalescent plasma is difficult. It is very, very useful for critically ill patients. You can find people who have recovered and use their plasma. But for a large scale antibody production and delivery, we need to find the monoclonal antibodies and then produce them in, in the industry. So let's now continue our discussion. So this guy over here uh, is saying to these B cells that, hey, guys, we just need one antibody or two antibodies that are neutralizing, we don't need thousands of those. So this is why all these little B cells are a little sad. They're not feeling very confident. So we need neutralizing or two or 10, but we need neutralizing antibodies. Good. Now let's continue our discussion. Let's make monoclonal antibodies. So how do we make monoclonal antibodies? Here is how we do it. First of all, the researchers, all those studies that I showed you, there are various processes to make them, but general idea is this. First of all, they try to find what is a part of the virus which, when attacked, will neutralize the virus. So they research... I'm very sorry about the cat here. So they research various um, plasmas. They take people's plasmas who have recovered then they look at the antibodies in those plasma and then they see what kind of antibodies are there. So painstaking work. And then they try to figure out which antibody out of all of that could be neutralizing antibody. And this is why the studies here, they were very happy to say that, hey, we found a neutralizing antibody. See, we found clonal antibodies from the B cells of the people who were recovered. Similarly here. So this is a matter of pride to be able to come back and say, I found in an antibody that can be neutralizing. So first, find an antibody that can act as a neutralizing antibody. 
this antibody also has to make sure that it doesn't harm other people, meaning humans. So let's say if you take this antibody and inject it in me, will this go and bind to my tissue as well? Just like in rheumatic fever, there are antibodies against strep, which then start reacting to our heart as well and damage our heart. So would this happen that there is an antibody which is neutralizing? It's a good antibody against the SARS-CoV, but when it is given into my body, it goes and attaches, attacks my heart or my kidney or my muscle or some other part of my body tissue. And would that cause damage? Thank you very much. The cat loves to pitch in as well. So number one, it should be neutralizing. Number two, it should not harm the human beings. Number three, it should be thoroughly tested and testable against the virus itself. So with this, so um, acoustic theory, stem cell has been used with certain success as well. So we can talk about that. Let's now look at how do we produce these antibodies. So now we're going to talk about producing monoclonal antibodies. Here, the researchers have already gone out, tried to find the memory B cells of the people. And now, so here we, here we are. A couple of ways. There are so many ways to make these antibodies. For example, one way is that you take the B cells from a person. I think this is the study. This study, these are the guys who did that. We set out to clone human antibody from the blood samples from the three COVID-19 recovered patients. So they went to the recovered patients and got their blood samples. Here they took the memory B cells. So they didn't take the blood samples, but memory B cells from the blood or from the lymph nodes. So there are so many ways to get the antibodies. However, let's look at a traditional way. What we do is, first of all, we start from here. This is the step number one. What we do is we take the antigen that we want. We don't take the whole virus. Instead, let's say we take the spike protein. If we think that spike protein is something that if we attack will neutralize the virus, then we take the spike protein. Here we are cutting them off and then inject those spike proteins or those antigens into a my mouse. Normally, these mouse or mice are trans transgenic. They are modified so that they are antibodies that they produce can be tolerated by human beings. So now that the antigen is in the mouse, the mouse would produce the antibodies against it and the spleen and the lymph nodes of the mouse would have the antibodies uh, or B cells. So we harvest this, the spleen of the mouse after four or five days and take the B cells from it. So that is here. This B cells, they can be monoclonal if if the antibody antigen presented to the mouse was a very tiny antigen. But if these were not tiny antigens, if the whole virus was given, then the antibodies produced by these cells are not going to be monoclonal. Then we would still have to have a step to produce the, to identify the monoclone clones. But here, let's say that we had already given a very small antigen and majority of the antibodies producing cells are now producing antibodies against, let's say, spike protein. Now the problem is these B cell that we took houses die. Now we want them to live forever so that they can produce antibodies. To do that, what we do is we fuse them with the cancer cells. Myelomas are also B cells, but they are cancerous. So that means they have learned to live forever. They have learned not to age. They have learned not to die. So we want these blue cells here, the B cells, we want these to become immortal and we have immortal cells that are cancer cells. If we can fuse them together, <coughs> then we can essentially make a, an immortal B cell that can make antibody forever. So that is the process of creation of hybridoma. So hybrid, there are two things that are uh, putting together. So how does that happen? This is a medium that is called hat medium. In this hat medium, they put the myeloma cells and the B cells of interest in this uh, area, in this medium. And what they do is they put polyethylene glycol and that would fuse all those cells that are next to each other, their membranes would burn and they would fuse with each other. 
Now, when they fuse with each other, they would become one cell, and that is a hybridoma or hybridoma cell. Interestingly, this is the clever part that humans do. What we do is, in this um, medium here, it is called a hat medium. It has hypoxanthine or hypoxanthine, amino opterine in it, and thymidine. Interestingly, look, this is a very clever thing. This this myeloma cell, <coughs> sorry, myeloma cells do not have an enzyme called HGPRT, which means that myeloma cells cannot make their DNA repairs or RNAs or purines through the degradation pathways. What that means is that you're, you're breaking down some building, you take the bricks from there and make a new building from it. It is called a salvage pathway. And myeloma cells have forgotten to do that. They can only make new buildings or their new parts within them through new systems, new processes. So we know that. And what we do is in this environment, we put this poison for myeloma cell. This is called amino opterin. Amino opterin is a folic acid analog. And when a myeloma cell takes up amino opterin as a folic acid, the enzyme, which is so funny, the enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase in that cell dies because it cannot work with that amino opterin. And that myeloma cell dies. So see, these two friends here, B cell and myeloma cell, they did not fuse together. And because they did not fuse, this myeloma cell would die. On the other hand, these two friends fused. And when they fused, the B cell would lend the HGPRT to this cell as well. And now this poisonous medium cannot kill this myeloma cell. And these two guys are going to live happily ever after. So the result of this treatment is that at the end of it, all myeloma cells that did not fuse will die. And all myeloma cells that have fused with the B cells would live. A hybridoma. Isn't that it? So when we have these hybridoma, normally what we can do is if we did not have a monoclonal hybridoma, we can make many, many clones. We can then find out the hybridomas or the cells that are of our interest that are making antigens against the parts of the, that are making antibodies against the part of the antigen that we uh, we have interest in, then we ask these guys to continue to live forever and produce antibodies. Those antibodies are the gold. These are clonal, and then you can take them and use them. However, most of the time, the story does not finish here. It does not finish here because this hybrid a very fine model. It produces still polyclonal antibodies. We now have to further refine these hybridomas to use only monoclones or those cells that are making antibodies against the antigen we want. So for that, what we do is we come here. We go to recombinology. So what does that mean? So here, let's say this is an antibody. If you look at this part, this is an antibody that is of interest. Let's say this is against the spike protein we could find hybridomas or B cells that were making antibodies against these spike proteins. What we do is we take the DNA or RNA material from these B cells. And I have done this part in a previous lecture, so that's why I didn't go in a very long de detail. It was a, I think, 30 minutes long lecture. But we do an RT-PCR on it. And we amplify the part of the gene which makes the antibody part that we want to have. And normally we want that against, so this variable region of the antibody, which is against the spike protein, for example, we will amplify its gene. Once we have amplified its gene, we take an a plasmid. A plasmid is nothing but a DNA loop. And what we do is in that plasmid, we inject this RNA of our interest, which is the uh, variable region for the antibody. And this green part is already the constant region of the antibodies. We take these plasmids 
and we put those plasmids in bacteria, for example. So see here, we put the plasmid in the bacteria and now we grow the bacteria and bacteria would divide and we feed them and they would not eat a lot of food, but they would keep dividing and keep secreting antibodies. Now we these and ship them out. This is another way. There is a simple way, as, there is one more modern way as well is that does not go through hybridoma at all. What they do is they directly do a PCR on the B cells, take up the gene for the variable region, then they insert those genes in the plasmids like this diagram, and then plasmid goes into the bacteria and the bacteria then makes the antibodies. So now what is the benefit of these antibodies? Benefit is, look, here is a number one, in this little while of antibodies, if we have thousands of, kind of kinds of antibodies in here, then it would be filled with lots of useless material. But if it is monoclonal antibody, then the whole vial itself or the bottle will be very, very precious. That is one. So it is very efficient to make monoclonal antibodies and ship them. Number two, when you inject the monoclonal antibodies, let's say this is a patient. This is a patient looks healthy to me. So, <clears throat> so when you inject the antibodies into the patient, remember this, somebody was asking me this question yesterday that can the antibody live in for two, three years? No. Antibodies that are given from outside, either they are through the convalescent plasma or they are monoclonal antibodies as we discussed here, these would start degrading or breaking down from the day two, three, to four to six weeks. So they provide immunity or help for a short period of time. So if this person was really, really sick and they needed help, then these antibodies can really go into their body and start working with, let's say, spike protein of the, of the virus and give their immune system enough chance to produce, start producing their own antibodies. So when I was talking about this, at, and these antibodies would break down anywhere from four days to four weeks or six weeks, they said, then how come people have three years, two years long immunity? And that is if they have their own memory B cells. If they have the B cells, which are the memory cells, then these cells can live in us for years and they would keep producing antibodies these antibodies would always be fresh. And whenever new coronavirus is going to come into our body, let's say next year, and that connects with the B cell, that B cell is going to produce huge number of antibodies by making copies of it. And all of those copies are going to start making antibodies. So there'll be a flood of antibodies against the virus. This is not the case with the antibodies that are brought in through the monoclonal therapies. But monoclonal therapies are really important to neutralize the virus in people who may become sick or who are sick and who are critically sick. And finally, these can also be used to make vaccines as well. So again, even vaccines would have a temporary solution. These are not permanent solutions. So this is the discussion. I try to go as fast as I can because the biggest feedback I get from the community is I'm slow. But I think that instead of just saying monoclonal, antibodies would help try to explain the mechanism so you can actually do your own thinking as well all right so this is it any questions uh, i had not looked at the chat too much today so maybe you can put your questions here aggressive pr and the tobacco companies will will uh, so and the tobacco companies have been running <laughs> massively against vaping. Michael, I think, so I think there's a discussion going on here. So you're a golden treasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, guys. So if this is something that is clear, we will tomorrow continue our discussion. So what do you think? Tomorrow should we discuss the asthma and sorry, the, uh, what was that? Cancer and uh, monoclonal, uh, sorry, cancer and uh, COVID-19 or do you want to discuss some other topic? For example, there was a request for nicotine or, or smoking and COVID-19 as well. 
So I'm open in whichever way you would like. I have started drawing these nice diagrams for you, though. So that is my maturity in my teaching. Very good, Ruslana. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so do you want to talk cancer tomorrow? So Harry says cancer. All right, so cancer and COVID. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right, so why not we, we do this then? Let's do the cancer and uh, COVID-19 tomorrow. So we'll do that tomorrow. Thank you very much and talk to you tomorrow. Please do me a favor, share this. Because these are long videos, normally people do not share it because they don't want to put this on somebody else. But I think that it, this may be something that is useful for them. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining. Stay safe and healthy. Respect to everyone who is a healthcare professional and who are risking your life to save others. Thank you very much and talk to you later. Bye-bye.